Now let's return to Morocco. The growth outlook for developing economies is now looking robust, and no thanks to the rising number of challenges around the world. The conversation around how the reverse to reverse the trend of lower growth in developing countries was led today on a panel at the Bretton Woods Institution's annual meetings by the Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, Antoinette Sai. First to say, of course, that you're absolutely right about the, the environment that our member countries are confronted with uh, uh, slower glo global growth, uh, of course, uh, uh, severely constrained policy space, some having none at all, uh, high debt levels, high costs of, high costs of servicing, servicing that debt, and uh, all of that making for a very, very difficult uh, a challenge around uh, investments that are needed to support growth and uh, you know, efforts to protect the most vulnerable uh, from uh, these turbulent uh, uh, shocks and times. So uh, this underscores, we think, the need to really uh, renew focus on structural uh, first-generation reforms. Uh, and those reforms, what are first-generation reforms? Uh, those that um, uh, 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 present the most binding constraints on economic activity. And uh, uh, they consist of uh, reforms uh, on governance, uh, you know, uh, regulatory environments that may overly constrain people seeking to put in place new businesses and to run them, and uh, external sector reforms uh, to reduce uh, trade restrictions, uh, to reduce, uh, to e expand access to uh, uh, foreign capital as well. So uh, together, those reforms uh, can really make for a big push in, uh, in output, uh, gains in output if, if, uh, if sequenced uh, and uh, prioritized and bundled, uh, they can actually make for a considerable uh, impact on growth. And uh, you know, it, it is really in those countries that are furthest from the, the border, as we, we might uh, call it, that are, have been less, less successful in pursuing such reforms to date, that one sees the, the highest impact of pursuing uh, those reforms. And those are countries with the greatest structural gaps, as we, we're calling them. So when, when those reforms are implemented in that type of economy, and if they're prioritized appropriately, sequenced appropriately, bundled together, uh, they can, uh, over a two-year period, say, in, in, in those types of economies, make for uh, an increase in growth of uh, 4%, and uh, in, in uh, over a four-year period, 8%. Uh, so I would like, first of all, to say that uh, as you said, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's very important for us to, to increase and to accelerate the growth, but the most important is to have to share the growth between all the people and all the regions. And I would like to emphasize that uh, as other countries, Morocco has to face a lot of uh, very important shocks. We had the COVID shocks, we had the, 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 the war in Ukraine and the impact on inflation, we have also the drought, five years of consecutive drive in Morocco, and uh, we had uh, this uh, uh, earthquake in, uh, in the house. Then it's not easy to face all these points at the same time. That's why we consider that for us, uh, and that's, it's, uh, it's written in our new model of development uh, and shared by all the people, but also it's what we did in our plan of the government, is we have to really uh, lead a lot of, of uh, very important work. We have, first of all, the challenge of equity, the challenge also of uh, giving uh, a very uh, new economy and develop the new economy, the challenge of sovereignty, the challenge, it's very important for us also, is to talk to, about the challenge of sustainability, and the challenge of resilience. So of course, we are still in the transformation mode because it never ends. If you want to grow, if you want to uh, build your wealth, you are always in some kind of a transformation and challenges are still there. But at the beginning of 19th, Poland was in an exceptional situation because we were one of the poorest countries in Europe bankrupt with hyperinflation. So that was our start. So definitely we needed very bold, deep reforms. Uh, and we had to make an effort 
to catch the West, catch up the West, to, 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 build, um, to build our economy, to go from the centralized economy to the open markets, to the modern, um, modern economy. So it all started especially with deep markets reforms, which was not an easy uh, decision to take. And the shape of these reforms, we could, we could have done better because these reforms were really very difficult for, uh, for people, for society, but uh, people understood that there are needed, if we want to be a part of the Europe, the Western Europe, uh, to which we aspired and uh, we wanted to be a, be a part of the European Union, but we could have done better because in this reforms, especially in the market reforms, we uh, didn't much uh, put uh, too, too much um, attention to the poorest one, to the most vulnerable people. And the effect of the reforms was, okay, the opening market, free market economy, uh, and the boom of the private, um, uh, private companies on the one hand, but on the other hand, we had a lot of uh, unemployment. And it took some time uh, to uh, first improve the budgetary position, improve the income come to the budget, uh, make necessary tax reforms, and then to realize a social programs, which were the priority for, for the government. Uh, and now the situation is uh, much, much better with unemployment uh, around uh, 3%. Uh, so, but this was maybe a mistake. Uh, we should take more attention to the protective measures uh, within the reforms. And let's sort of first contextualize the number, contextualize the, the, the problem, right? How's, it's a big problem. Right? Sort of, this is a becoming a sort of the existential issue, is how do you finance transition? Uh, and and sort of when we did our numbers a few, few months ago, which, by the way, the IMF came up with, some, with, with another set of numbers over the weekend, uh, similar, the numbers are really large. You're talking about roughly, just for emerging markets outside China, you're talking about rough, roughly no, $1.9 trillion every year between now and 2050. Well, that's a huge number, right? And clearly, the fiscal space and the credit worthiness of most of the countries that need that kind of money is simply not available. Right, the ability, money is not available, or we have the money, but it's not accessible. The fiscal space, the ability of the public sector to shoulder that magnitude of funding, especially when there are alternative and other equally needed uh, reasons, not least of which is poverty alleviation, income inequality, dealing with those most in need of financing, right? The money Okay, then let's take that conversation a little bit further because Zambia is set to finalize its $6.5 billion debt talks with a group of creditors in a few days' time, and that's according to the International Monetary Fund. So in the meantime, debt continues to plague many African economies from Egypt to Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, and beyond. Let's take excess from this panel discussion today in Morocco on tackling the risk of debt in particular for developing countries. We should be concerned, but recognize that we are not at the footsteps of a debt crisis. Why we should be concerned? Because over the last years, governments, households, businesses, had to borrow to sustain their function. And that everywhere has piled up higher uh, than it is good for, uh, for those who take on that debt. Where is the problem most severe? It is in low-income countries. It is actually there where half are either at that distress or near that distress. That doesn't apply for the rest of the world. For emerging market eco economies, in other words, middle-income countries, about 20% are now in distressed territory. When we look at low-income countries, they're being hit three times. First, because they stepped into these shocks with very little to protect themselves, almost no buffers. 
and whatever they had has disappeared. Second, because if interest rates are high, they borrowed to sustain their people, mm. and now interest rates are eating into their revenue. You know, if you took sub-Saharan Africa, sub-Saharan Africa these days is paying, for all the reasons Kristalina pointed out, you know, interest rates have doubled and so on. They're paying 7.6% of their GDP to pay down debt, to pay back the interest cost on debt. Now, you could say, is 7.6% good or bad? For comparison, what they spend on education and healthcare together is 5.6%. So, 7.6% is a lot, therefore. That's the first issue. The second issue is, what that does effectively is it crowds out the ability of those governments to be able to put money to work for human capital, for climate, for infrastructure, for the things they need to put their country onto the right pathway for the coming years. You are going back to a challenging period uh, in 2020, and Kristalina uh, was um, instrumental in reaching the DSSI. I mean, it's, it was a very difficult um, period. Uh, you know, funds were actually even very thinly available. Um, countries were scrambling for their own lives uh, and on their own people. But still, there was hope that, you know, creditors, even with the shock that they were facing in their own countries, actually cared about debtor countries. They came together um, through IMF, World Bank, and the G20, and, and uh, decided to do the debt service suspension initiative, which gave uh, actually about $13 billion of breathing space to 48 nations. That's not uh, small. But then it is actually not possible just to suspend debt service you know, indefinitely. The World Bank has been wonderful. The Paris Club, the official creditors committee, led by France, China, and South Africa, They've been wonderful. The creditors have been wonderful. So thank you, everybody, <laughs> for delivering this uh, to us. Thank you so much indeed. You talked about the reforms that we have had to implement. Obviously, the first thing on the reform agenda, and perhaps we have never said this to you. Let me tell you that it's uh, embarrassing to find yourself in debt distress. It is embarrassing because it is not long ago when we had the HIPIC and other debt restructuring mechanisms. So one of the first things that we did was to say, never again should we allow this to happen in our country, at least not in this administration. Mm -hmm.